Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. It's a super mini mail call episode, and I think you probably know what that means. We're gonna be opening up packages today. And down on the floor here, I have a big box that's just filled with tons of packages, small packages here, and I wanna to start to chip away at these. So let me just grab one here. This one's kind of big off the floor here. And this one here comes from Johan in Nash, Texas. Out of all my Texas viewers. It's pretty heavy. I have a feeling this is gonna be a whole load of components. From time to time, I get contacted by viewers saying that they were like an engineer in their past lives or whatnot, and they've cleaned out their basement or their garage or whatever, and they found a whole ton of potentially useful components. Now down here in the basement, I think I've talked about this about a billion times. One of my problems is like space. Obviously I have a limited amount of space. So I don't, don't want to fill it up too much with stuff. But the other problem is organization and having spare components is great but it's not great when they're in boxes and I'm not well organized because <laughs> then when I go to need something, I'll spend like an hour looking for something and think, I think I have one of those or spend a couple hours looking only to come to the conclusion that I don't have what I needed. Now, someone recently here locally gave me a bunch of organizers with little drawers, you know, the things you could like mount on the wall and put components in. And I, there's a good number of those. And I hope to figure out a place to put those, A, and then come up with a system to start organizing stuff. So like if we talk about 74 LS chips, group them into like tens, like LS00 through LS09 and put those all in one drawer and so on and so forth and put labels and stuff. That way, if I'm not sure I have like an LS138, at least I can just go to the drawer that's like in the range and just open that up and just dig through. And I'm like, okay, I don't have one. So let me go order one. But that comes back to one of the funny things is like you need wall space to put those drawer organizers. And that's actually something I don't have a lot of because I have all these shelves up down here, like covering all the wall space with shelves so I can hopefully organize with that and have little bins and stuff. So I was actually kind of thinking of putting a piece of plywood along the side of this like bench area I have here because there's actually uh, some space that's open on the end. And then I can mount some of those drawers just along the side there. And if I do that floor to ceiling and I put the stuff I don't use as much in those drawers, then that might be a really good way to start to get organized. But it's all like a time thing as well. Like not just putting the shelves up, but starting to do that sorting process. And that's just something that I haven't really been able to find time to do, even though I'm doing this full time now, just because I try to make two videos a week. And in the list of priorities, organization just seems to always fall to the bottom. All right, so let's see what we have in this box here. I sort of got off topic immediately. I didn't even open a package without getting off topic. So Johan looks to have included a business card from Memotronics, where Johan must work lighting and industrial, it says here in uh, Nash, Texas. And right off the bat, candy. <laughs> loads and loads of candy. So Harry Bows, Harry Bows. This might all be Harry Bows. <laughs> And I was thinking I'd have, I'd have stuff to organize when it came to uh, components. That's not actually the case. <laughs> yeah, we have 100% Haribo content here. Well, what is pretty hilarious here is, I think it's kind of known that I like Haribo and I don't even know where this really started. I mean, who doesn't like Haribo? I know the odd person who doesn't like it, but most people do like it. I am a type one diabetic, right? So. I can't just eat candy willy nilly. I mean, A, I'm trying to not become like a, you know, extra round in the middle section. <laughs> so my candy usage is sort of all over the place because sometimes I'll just have, oh, I don't know, I'll be eating properly and my blood sugar's never low. Other times I will have low blood sugar and I do need to eat some candy. And in fact, like the other day, I was eating some gummy bears and I didn't have any Harry Bows. Well, I mean, I had these in the house, but I didn't know I had these. So I was eating some gummy bears that just came from like the supermarket bulk section. I mean, they're perfectly good but I don't need to buy any of those for a while now because I got all this and it's freaking awesome. All right, so one of the things is we take a look at this stuff. We can tell this is actually from Europe. This is not US manufactured or not made for the US market. And now this sounds vaguely familiar that Johannes, I think that's how you pronounce Johannes's name, was traveling abroad and brought this stuff all back in the suitcase for me, <laughs> which is freaking awesome, I gotta say. Now I would imagine that the stuff that's sold in each of the countries is localized. So it's gonna be in like the local language. And this does appear to be German to me, but I may be mistaken. And maybe this comes from another country. Let's see if I can figure that out. So right here it says D-A and C-H. I think this is for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, I think. I mean, 
I'm sorry if I'm I'm screwing that up. But yeah, I think this is all in German here. And I mean, I'm never going to complain about getting awesome German Harry bows. So we just look through here what we got. So that's sold here. These are sold here. Those are the sour gummy bears. And those are as well. And we got sour as well. And I do have to say, I really like the sour ones. And then I think we've got completely into stuff that's not sold here. Now, <laughs> I've had these before. I freaking love these. These are my favorite. I, I don't know why, but this particular, these Pico Bellas, Pico Bellas are absolutely my favorite. Hey, it's vegetarian. That's great. Now this one's filled with black licorice, which I am not a huge fan of, but I have friends who are, so that's no problem. The Colorados, which is a funny name. I don't really know where that comes from. It's an interesting kind of assortment and mix. So you got all sorts of different things in here, including um, some that are a little unusual, but it's nice to just have a cool mix of stuff. But look, you have a regular gummy bear in there, for instance. Here's a new one that I've never had. I guess it's a yogurt flavored uh, fruit mania. Neat, so yogurt flavored. And then we have rainbow savers. <laughs> okay, I think these are really good because it has like a milk flavored candy on the inside. Absolutely love those. Then we have a Smurf version here, and I think I've had these before, and they're okay. They're sort of just really sweet. Nothing, I mean, you're eating Smurfs. Is that a good thing? I don't know. And then this one is filled with rings. Okay. <laughs> An entire package of black liquors for those who absolutely love it. Uh, Tropa Fruity, uh, Milk Barons, uh, really also one of my favorites because each one of these has the, the milk flavored candy on it or whatever. And we have one more Smurfs one. So I'm not gonna do candy review on the channel. I talked about the fact I'm not gonna do those anymore, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna open up a couple of these like the Pico Balas here. Oh yeah, and I love these. I like how they're small as well. Yeah, absolutely delicious. And these are really, really sweet as well. So remember when I said that some of the German stuff isn't as sweet? Well, these are like mega sweet. So inside here we have loads of black licorice. <laughs> Let's try one that's um, not obviously black licorice like this one. Yeah, that was actually black licorice, even though it had a reddish color on the outside. And then we have a little bat here. So like leftover from Halloween or something, black licorice as well. What's funny about black licorice to me is that in some parts of the world, it's extremely popular and like everyone loves it. But in other places, it's really not something that's very common that people like. So it's kind of an acquired taste. And the funny thing is, is when I was young, I really didn't like it. But I have to say, as I get older now and I'm approaching my 50s, that I... I don't love it, but it's not as off-putting as it used to be either. At least these aren't. Now I've had some stuff people have sent in like from the Netherlands that's like so strong and salty that it's uh, a bit much even for me. But on the other hand, like this stuff, there's something about it that I, I kind of like, but don't get me wrong. <laughs> I much, much prefer like these <laughs> to the black licorice stuff. But on the other hand, if I was dying for a piece of candy and I didn't have any candy in the house, yeah, I'd eat, I'd eat this stuff. Now the pure black licorice like this, that might be a little bit much. When it's candy like this, it's black licorice on the inside and it's got some kind of like sweet candy on the outside. So you have the salty bitter taste of the black licorice combined with the uh, sweetness. But it is very curious to me how something like taste can be so influenced by your upbringing. Like I just don't understand why you go to the Netherlands and you have like so many people there that for instance like black licorice and then you go here in the US and you ask around and most people don't like it. I wonder if taste has something to do with like habitualization. So you're exposed to it a lot when you're a kid and at that point your brain connections are forming, you know, you're, you're growing up, those neurons pathways are happening and something changes in your brain when you're eating a lot of one thing that makes you really like it. And if you're not exposed to that when you're a kid and then you eat it later in life, you're like, oh, I don't really like it at all. I don't know. That's really curious to me how taste profiles are so different from one place to another. And if any of my viewers watching have any ideas about like what's going on with that phenomenon, I'd love to know more about it because it is very curious to me. And, and that's not to say that here in the US, there aren't people who absolutely love black licorice. I have a friend who loves it. He, the saltier, the, the more bitter, the better for him. He absolutely would go to that over any of his other candy first. Meanwhile, most people, that, that's just not the case. So anyways, kind of interesting. Thank you very much, Johannes, for sending this in. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name a few times at the beginning of this segment. And let me clear this off and we'll go to the next package. I have to say when I was moving the Haribo off the desk, <laughs> I ate a bunch more of it. So my blood sugar is probably gonna be a bit high. In fact, I'm gonna just take a bit more insulin here, which I'll do with my insulin pump. 
Oh, you know what? My blood sugar is actually dropping. It's heading down right now, and there's a bunch of insulin on board, which means it's in my system. So that candy was probably actually a good thing. So no extra insulin. All right, so our next package here, unfortunately, I've had this since June of last year. So hopefully there's no candy in this. And this is one of my issues. Like these small packages all go into a big box and they just get jumbled up and sometimes stuff falls to the bottom. And yeah, I need to be a bit better about that. It comes from the, someone in the UK. I can't really read the sender's name. So let's uh, open this up and see what it is. I think what this might be, I'm just sort of guessing here, is this might be something for my BBC Master. I think this is like a SD card storage solution for it. When I had that machine on the channel, I think that this was a viewer that offered to send me stuff for it. And yes, that looks to be exactly what it is. All right, so we have a letter here. This comes from Richard. I trust this parcel finds you well. Well, yes, thank you very much, Richard. I was well back in June of last year, and luckily I'm still good, and we're, <laughs> we're all the way in February now. In fact, by the time this video comes out, it may be March. Oh, that's really bad, I gotta say. I'm very sorry about that. Richard was on to say that he's been a longtime fan of my channel and learned a lot from watching, even if it's something what not to do. Yep, I do show those mistakes. I love seeing the BBC Master appear recently, and I thought I'd send you over a couple bits that will increase its functionality for you. First is an MOS ROM upgrade. It not only has the old V3.2, but also the newer 3.5 and older OS 1.2 from the BBC Model B and OS 2.0 from the Model B Plus, the 64K variant. These are selected by changing two jumpers between four possible positions. Off and off is 3.5, and I think my computer has 3.2 on it. As the Model B and B Plus don't use all the ROM space, the other gaps have been filled with a couple of instant run games. The MOS, which also, by the way, stands for Machine Operating System, 3.50, also has the Y2K clock bug fix, so setting the time with, for example, that command. Um, and showing the time back actually works correctly. Oh, that's awesome. I've also included my internal SD card solution as it has its own page included in the box, but no more hogging of the user port. Oh, that's pretty nice actually, because I have a homebrew one on my BBC Master now that I sort of made myself, and that is plugged in on the underside of the machine on the user port. It was like something I just sort of found some plans for online and soldered together with some parts I had laying around. With the user port free, it means you can also hook up things like the BBC Turtle, which is a logo, physical manifestation of logo. So you run logo and then the turtle actually is a little robot that will like draw on a paper uh, from what you do on your computer. It's pretty sweet. I've seen that demoed. Uh, also the AMX mouse. The included ROM also has MMFS. So this is one of the file systems for the system, which holds all the disk images in a single beeb.mmb file and also MMFS2, MMFS2, which uses SSD images. If you wanna try MMFS2, you need to either use one of the other two ROM sockets and use the unplug insert commands to ensure that only one MMFS ROM is active. Or you can build a quick mod, pull low or high the address line on the chip. Hope you find this useful. All the best, Richard, AKA UKWEBB on star.forms. That's the place to go for everything to do with these BBC or Acorn machines. All right, well, thank you very much for that. Let's see what was included. Okay, a pack of actual BlueTac. That's awesome. Very, very handy. And um, I do use BlueTac. Here's some right here. This is for soldering chips on the boards. I just sort of like stick that down on there and it holds the sockets in or whatever the, the component. Now you can buy this in the US, it's way less common than it is in the UK. I think this is called poster putty, maybe something like that. Now I bought a package of it and I think I have more of it around, but I think I've lost some of it and maybe this is all I have. I just keep this handy and it's pretty dirty and gross because I uh, use it for the soldering, as I said, but this is the real deal here. The actual blue tack, the original reusable adhesive. Now, this seems to be manufactured by Bostic Limited, and they have an office in the UK and also in Ireland, in Dublin. I don't think this stuff is sold in the US. <laughs> Hashtag blue hack with your blue tack. Cute. Hey, you know what? I find it kind of curious that this blue tack is a much lighter color than I would have expected. I thought this would be more the same color as the blue tack that I have in the US here. It feels the same. It's like similarly sticky, like it's sticky enough, but then, uh, it doesn't actually leave residue. So for instance, if I stick that on the pen there and then stick it on there, see it sticks together and then, well, that came off relatively easily actually. It doesn't generally leave residue. You have to kind of like push it firmly, but it's great for holding on, for instance, a little circuit board on the bottom of the computer. You just stick this on and then it won't come off. 
and it will hold on quite well. And then when you do want to remove it, you just take it off like that. Now this stuff, on the other hand, let's see if I do the same test. It's, it's obviously more of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it works, it works the same way. Now this stuff has been exposed to heat a bunch of times from when I solder with it. And that does kind of cause it to, I don't know, get weird and stringy and stuff, but they do feel absolutely identical. Like when it comes to stickiness quotient, but then they don't leave any sticky residue behind. So this stuff is pretty awesome. But like I said, you can buy this here in the U S Oh, here it is. I found the U S stuff. It was in my drawer. Fun tack by Loctite mounting putty. So it's not called blue tack. It's probably a name that's patented or whatever. Oh, look, another pack of blue pack. Okay. So cool. There's, there's two packs of blue tack. What's the difference here? Oh, white tack. Someone just used that. Was it Techmone? I think Techmone recently had the white tack on a video <laughs> and I kind of gave a chuckle. So blue tack and white tack. And then we have the Loctite fun tack <laughs> with a K without the C. And <laughs> okay. That's just pretty hilarious. Take a look at this. The Loctite brand stuff is actually made in South Africa by the Henkel Corporation. Well, and the mounting instructions are very similar. So you just break off a piece and then you knead it a little bit till it's soft and warm and then you stick it together. And it looks like originally it had four strips and I guess this is all that's left of that strip. So you know what, this stuff's look getting a little gross. I'll just, um, you know what? I'll switch to the blue tack stuff. Why don't we do that? So that'll be what I use from now on. I'll just uh, keep this stored away. So this nice sky blue stuff is what you're gonna see <laughs> in future videos when I'm doing my board work. <laughs> cool. So there you go. If you live in the US and you want to get some blue tack, uh, the easiest thing to do is you just go to any store, hardware store, and you can get this fun tack. And it really is exactly the same. So the video has been going on for quite a while. and We've not looked at a single piece of hardware and here everything is that Richard sent in. So in the middle, we have the SD card solution here, and this is obviously the internal version. And my presumption is it works in combination with this and you use this cable here to connect to that header right there. And then this is the SD card slot. Now on mine, which I'll grab the machine in a second, the one I have looks similar to this and it's just stuck on the bottom of the machine. Oh, look, there's even a little double-sided adhesive right there. It's stuck on the bottom of the machine and the wires come off the header and they just plug into the user port and it just works. That's so unbelievably easy to add the SD card slot to the master. So right here we have the ROM that has all the various things in there. So you could obviously do a couple things. You could install a switch on the back of the machine that runs to these and then you can select which ROM you want or of course, open the computer up and move the jumpers around. Now I'm not super familiar with all the various incompatibilities of these different ROM versions. So I wouldn't even know which of the better or best ones to run on the master. So I guess at first I'm just gonna install this and set it for the newest one, 3.5 and then see what happens. But I wonder if you need to run these older versions for some of the older BBC software when you're running it on the master. Oh yeah, that's right. And then what we have here is the modem adapter. So there's an internal modem that is possible on the master. And I think what this does is it plugs into the same header on the motherboard, but then you see we have a 6522 here, which just adds an extra user port plus a SD card slot. And it uses the same, I guess, area in memory here, FE80, as where the modem used where sat originally. And who cares about a modem these days? No one. So this is far more useful when you are used in combination with the SD card here and it frees up all the ports on the underside of the machine. That's really ingenious and so cool. So I'll connect up the DuPont connections. We'll just make sure the ground wire is the same. So black wire is ground and then the same on that one right there. So I guess that's ready for installation and Richard included some handy dandy install instructions. So just like I said here, this thing adds two extra ports. So we have one port is dedicated to the SD card reader. And while port A is available for use, it's pin compatible with a standard user port. It's only difference is it connected to address FF81 and FF83 rather than the usual FE60 and 62. If you need both ports, just remove the SD card module and jumper the pin on the board and affix the socket into position B. Port B is located at these addresses. So first step is of course, installing that ROM board. I recommend using this in the middle of your three spare ROM slots, but you could use an external cartridge if you want. Next step is install the main board support, which is this little uh, 3D printed part here. And that's because the motherboard is flexible. And if you install this, it just supports that. I think as you like push it on. Next step is just to plug the adapter board into the motherboard, just like where the modem would go. Connect up the SD card reader to the new user port board. And then it appears the idea is just install the SD card slot uh, by the power supply. I guess there's a little opening in the case right there. And that allows you to easily access the card while the lid is on. 
Once everything is powered back on, you type star card, that selects the card, and then star dot, which is the equivalent of the directory command on BBC systems, and then shift break reboots the system and you end up in the menu with all the games and stuff. Very easy installation process. All right, so let me go grab the BBC Master and let's get this stuff installed. So I have the BBC Master here and let's first check to see if this computer is still fully operational. This thing has such a nice feeling keyboard. It really, it really does. I hope the keys all still work though. I remember I had to do a whole bunch of scratching and polishing of the little shafts that are inside each key switch so that they would work. They were all sort of oxidized. Flipping the computer over, you'll notice my little uh, SD card hack together interface. Yes, I just sort of hot glued it right onto the user port here. A little blue tack holding the cable on, and this is held on with blue tack as well. And um, yeah, it hasn't fallen down after sitting on my shelf for all that time. And just in case you're worried, I put a bunch of hot glue all over the user port here. It's no big deal. You just put a little 99% IPA and it releases the hot glue super easily. Now this computer, like all the Acorn machines, does have an RGB output, also has a composite video output right here. What I'm gonna do before we start testing this stuff that Richard sent in is I need to make a new cable that goes from the RGB output on this thing to the RGB to HDMI. I originally had a SCART cable that came with one of my machines and I could have just plugged that into something like the Retro Tank. Problem is I actually cut the SCART end off of it and I put a nine pin connector so I could plug these computers directly into a Commodore 1084 monitor. Now with the RGB to HDMI, it expects a TTL input, at least the way I have this one configured. So I need to make another cable that goes from the RGB output on this thing, which is a DIN connector to a nine pin that is set up for like CGA style RGB video. Okay, just like that, I have a cable here. This goes from the RGB on this machine, BBC Micro, also I think the Acorn Electron, and I labeled this with BBC TTL. So it's wired up for like the CGA pinout basically. The only difference is there's no intensity bit. So I have that just grounded inside and there's a composite sync instead of horizontal plus vertical. So I just have the sync wire going to both the pins on here. I think the RGB to HDMI only looks at one of the pins. So this wouldn't work with a CGA monitor because it's, uh, it's not sending horizontal and vertical sync, but it'll definitely work with the RGB to HDMI. So we'll just connect this up to the cable, which goes to the RGB to HDMI. And let's power this thing on. There we go, it's freaking working. And what's even cooler is you can see there, we have retained our CMOS settings for this machine. And that's because I installed that new Necroware clock module into this thing. So I don't have to have any AA batteries that are gonna leak inside this machine. It's like a 10 year clock. We'll take a look at that in a second. Let's get the cover off. I've already removed the four screws that fix the cover on this thing. And it's so easy to take the cover off. I absolutely love it. So here's the modem header that we're gonna be connecting that second user port to. And there is the new clock module that I've gone ahead and installed. I removed the old clock chip and that way there is no need to connect a battery to the old battery header anymore. It comes from this little sealed lithium cell. I noticed on the GitHub repo for this particular module here, it actually mentions my video where I use this in the BBC Master. And it did say that I should have pulled up the pin here. This is like the Motorola pin, I think it was, to five volts using a 10K resistor. And that really is just a safety thing in case the clock chip that's on the bottom of this little PCB goes bad, we're not gonna have a dead short to five volts. So checking out the instructions, this looks a little bit different where the power supply is. This is the top edge of the keyboard compared to what this machine actually looks like. On this computer, the power supply is flush right up against this plastic edge. So I don't think I can at least easily run the cable through that slot right there as indicated just because uh, it's not really possible, I guess, unless I remove the power supply. The idea of running this cable through the slot in the case is so you can actually access the SD card externally on the machine to load new software relatively easily. I've removed the screws for the power supply and I did have to take a couple out for the keyboard. I think this thing should come out. There we go. And there you can see those slots that are mentioned in the installation instructions. So if this module is gonna go here, so let's see about getting these through here. So there we go. I was able to just stick the wire right through there. And let's hope that there's enough space there so I can get this power supply back in place. Disconnect these power supply cables. And we just need to get this little strengthening thing under the motherboard right here. Like that. That's good. So when you push down on the motherboard here, it actually pushes down that little printed plastic piece. And then this just goes into here like that. Nice. And just reconnect these power cables. 
Now the power supply is just sitting here. It's not screwed in. There are three screws on the bottom that hold that in, but it looks like this should be able to screw in without any issue, even with this wire stuck like that. Next up, we need to install this ROM here. So if we take a look at the bottom here, it actually has the same pinout, I think, as these chips over here. Yes, it does. And it looks like here it's saying to install that into this socket right here where I already have this MMFS ROM that I obviously made. We're gonna pull that out and we're gonna replace it with the one that Richard sent. So out with that ROM. And actually now I think about it, there's this ROM that Richard sent as well, the MA MMFS Master Version 1 and Version 2 which I just realized this is the one that's going to go into this socket. Um, and I don't know if this one that I made is actually just the same thing. Maybe it is. But I'm going to assume the one that Richard sent is better. So that's going in there, out with mine. And when it comes to this one with the selectable MOS ROM, machine operating system, I think it replaces this ROM right here. And even in this picture right here, it shows a little board here plugged into that same top socket. And this obviously goes off to a switch, maybe on the back of the machine that allows you to pick which ROM you're gonna access. So we'll just replace this top one here with the one that Richard sent. Just make sure all the pins are straight, they are. All right, there we go. I think we're all set. So I think now we're ready for a test. I don't have the SD card connected to this and I still have the other one plugged into the user port, my old one. So let's power this on, make sure we hear the beep. I think that's a startup beep. Yep, there we go, we're all good. It made the normal clicky sounds. So let's power it on again. I have the RGB connected this time. Yes, there we go. And I'm pretty sure, and yes, reading the letter here, it's talking about the fact that FE 80 is the new user port right here that I just installed. So theoretically you can type star card and I don't have it plugged in, right? So it's not gonna work. And we do star dot, wait, what's happening here? Why is this happening? Caps lock is on. Yes, okay, it was, that's why star dot. Okay, and it says card because there's nothing plugged in. So with the system powered off, I'm just gonna flip this over so I can reattach the screws for this. I'm gonna plug that SD card reader into this cable that's sticking through the case now and let's see what happens. All right, power supply screws are back in and let's plug this in. Now I remember the black wire here, I had it to the ground wire or ground the pin that is. Now this one here, I'm just gonna pull this up and that blue tack is, uh, wow, very sticky there. Let's just, uh, <laughs> let's just get this out of the way here. Now this one here, I'm gonna remove from the system and I'm gonna install this onto my BBC Model B. I have to get back to those machines, but I have two of those that do work. Oh, this actually has double-sided adhesive, so blue tack doesn't really work with that. So I think what I'm gonna do is we'll just test to make sure this works, and then when it does, that I'll just stick this down with the double-sided tape. And in the meantime, I'm just gonna use some 99% IPA, just drizzle a little bit on here so I can get this, get this off the user port here. There we go. Oh, I just realized, yeah, I didn't need to do that. I have this connector on here. I just had hot glue on there. So the wires had a little strain relief. Whoops. All right, power this back on. All right, star card and star period. Yes, it just works. It's like magic. That is freaking awesome. And then it says, if all looks good, you hit shift break to boot into the menu. And there it is. It just freaking works. Awesome. My insulin pump was just beeping because I have low blood sugar. So time for a little Harry bow candy. It's perfect. It's like a two in one episode here. And I just happen to have low blood sugar. So I actually need the candy. Okay, so when we turn this computer on with the main MOS ROM with the two jumpers removed, it looks like we are running, oops. I would think this is the ROM for the BBC Master. And according to the letter here, it says when both jumpers are off, we're running MOS 3.5. I don't know how we can see that. I thought it would show up here in the ROM list, but it, it doesn't. If I install one of the jumpers and we turn the machine back on, ah, okay, I think we're running, this looks like something from the BBC Model B. Oh, I just realized I should be using the help command. There we go, we're running MOS 2.0 now, which I think is the one from the BBC Model B 64K. And if we go back to no jumpers, and we do this again, but I type help this time, like I should have. Yeah, so at the top, MOS, Machine Operating System 3.5. Awesome. Both jumpers installed. We are running OS 1.2, which I think is the oldest or one of the older versions of the machine operating system from the original BBC Model Bs. 
and I have just the lower of the two jumpers installed, and now we're on OS 3.2, which I'm pretty sure is the exact same version that I had uh, in this machine when I got it, the one that's on this ROM chip right here. All right, so let's boot up that menu again, and we'll just try playing a game. So we have everything working here, and we do shift break to reset into the menu. And as you can see here, we have tons and tons of software. I think this is exactly the same thing that was on my other SD card. It's just basically all the games that have ever been made for all these Acorn machines. So let's try running Jet Set Willy. So we hit R, hit enter, and there it is. Tinesoft Jet Set Willy. Okay, so we have a little bit of corruption here, and I think that is understandable. The game, oh yeah, it doesn't look like it's working either. I very quickly died there. So the weird thing is if I start the game, I just immediately die and lose all my lives. Is that how it's supposed to work? I, I really haven't played this game very much. I tried it on the Spectrum. I don't remember, I mean, I know it's hard, but I don't remember dying immediately, losing all your lives right away. So I wonder if this has something to do with the corruption here that's going on. Now rebooting out of that, I think what might be happening is I've noticed in that menu, there are uh, some games from the older BBCs that don't work on the master properly. And I think there's some architectural changes, some subtle architectural changes on here that seem to cause those issues. And I have some friends who have the master as well. And I asked them, hey, can you try this particular game on theirs? And they did, and they're like, oh yeah, it doesn't work on mine in the same exact way. So I know there's not like a fault on this machine. Now, I wonder if this has something to do with the MOS version, the machine operating system version. And maybe if I go back to the older BBC version that I can then see if I can run those games and maybe they'll work properly. Okay, I rebooted and I have the top jumper installed on here. So now we're in the original version of the OS MOS 2.0, which is for the, uh, the BBC Model B. Now, one of the issues here is that currently it is loading the disk file system and not the MMFS, which is like a later file system that is designed for these SD cards and stuff like that. And I don't remember the exact command to load the MMFS. Okay, after fiddling around a little bit, I was able to unplug the ROM, uh, like the DFS ROM. And when I hit shift break now, the MMFS FE80 version shows up. So now if I do card, oh, that's not working. Interesting. If I do shift break, card, is that an error? That's an error, isn't it? I wonder why it's not seeing the card. I mean, everything is connected just as it was before. But if we hit shift break, it's trying to boot, auto boot basically off the card and that's not working. If I lift the jumper here and we power the computer back on, let's see what this does now. Card, yeah, it's working fine. So there it is, it shows the card. Well, let's play another game here. Let's try Chucky Egg, which is a pretty popular game. Please stop the tape. Well, the tape's not installed, so. <laughs> Sorry, there's like, the sound is coming out of the internal speaker here and there's no volume control, not externally. There's one in the configuration in the BIOS you can set up, but I can't do that right now, obviously. All right, Chucky Egg. Press S to start, K to change keys. I don't know what keys we need to use. I pressed K, ah, here we go, up. All right, I'm gonna use the number keypad here. Up, down, left. Uh, it does not like four for left. Why? I guess we'll do five. <laughs> That's weird, and zero for jump. Okay, so uh, S to start. How many players? We'll just do one. Get ready player one. Now it's nice seeing this in color, isn't it? Because I have the RGB to HDMI hooked up. All right, what is the uh, premise of this game? Oh, wow. So to go up on the ladder, you have to be, <laughs> you have to be pixel perfect. I'm pushing up. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, come on. It's so, that's such BS. There is a jump command. I don't know if I die if I fall down onto those uh, that platform there. Let's try. Ah, oh, it worked. Okay. Whoa. Can I jump over that ostrich? <laughs> no. <laughs> you can't jump. All right. So this is a platform game for the uh, <laughs> the older BBCs. All right. Let's try to at least clear a level here. 
Oh, come on. I'm sorry, I'm not having four as a, as a way to move. <laughs> All right, ostrich, get out of here. Get out of here. Whoa. Come on. I was struggling just to get onto that platform. You have to be like pixel perfect to get on and off the platforms. That's brutal. <laughs> no, this is so difficult to use the ladders. There we go. <laughs> that took me like so long just to... There we go. I'm gonna finish the level. <laughs> it's so hard to use those ladders. It's ridiculous. Oh, there's moving platforms now. That's awesome. So this game, I, you know, I could see back in the day if this was uh, a computer that I had and um, let's get onto the platform here. Ooh, yeah. Um, I would have had a lot of fun with this game. I really would have. I would have probably gotten used to the very difficult to use platforms, uh, ladders I mean, where you have to be pixel perfect. Whoa. <laughs> oh, wow, you can't get, how do you get to that one? To jump and get it? Yep, you gotta jump to get it. Interesting. I guess there's tactics you start to learn this game. <laughs> All right, well, that is it. The BBC Master is obviously working. It's nice I finally got the RGB cable made because all that Acorn Electron stuff I was doing, the cable would have worked. This cable would have worked with that as well. And we were stuck with black and white composite with all the testing. <laughs> so it's pretty awesome that um, I could finally see in full color and through the RGB to HDMI so we can capture. Before, obviously, I had the color video. I just had to do it on my Commodore 1084 monitor which is not ideal when you're doing videos like this, because I don't, you know, filming a CRT is a big pain in the butt. If you're watching and you're an expert at these Acorn machines and you know why we get some corruption in some of the games, the older games that uh, when they're running on the master, definitely let me know. I'd be very curious to know if running those older machine operating system ROMs from the BBC Model B will actually make those games work properly on this computer, or if that's not really the case anyways. And if that is the case, can I use those older machine operating system ROMs in combination with the modified MMFS that uses this modem port and have that work? Because I, you know, you saw it wasn't working, but as soon as I went back to the original master ROM or even the 3.5 that we're using now, which is Y2K fixed and whatever other bug fixes there are, we can load off the card without any issues. So it's probably something I did wrong, typing the wrong command or whatever to, to get that to work. Also, I'd be really curious to know why using those old MOS ROMs is worthwhile. Maybe, maybe it is to fix those corruption and things in the games or something like that. So yeah, anyways, that's really awesome though. I love this computer and I love how this thing is kind of tricked out now a little bit. There's obviously so much more I can do with this thing. There's the Econet or Econet networking stuff that you can do. I think you can use a Raspberry Pi and network multiple machines together. And this can act as a server and all sorts of like fancy stuff like that. Of course, there's the tube interface on the bottom of this that allows you to emulate other systems like a coprocessor kind of thing. Or you can use a Raspberry Pi to emulate all these different processors, including like a 6502 that's running at like, you know, 500 megahertz or something like that. So you can run certain patched games, like there's a version of Elite, I think, that runs on this, that then takes advantage of that super duper fast, like emulated CPU to then actually make the game run at a really good speed. Also, the original development of the ARM processor, the Acorn Risk Machine, well, what is in our phones and stuff these days, and Macintoshes, that all started on the BBC Model B, plugged into the tube interface on the bottom of the computer. It was like the coprocessor's capabilities that these Acorn machines had that allowed that really easy development. So there is all sorts of cool stuff you can do with that as well. I think for me personally, what I need to really do is bust out my Model Bs. I have two of them. I need to like combine the two machines and make one really nice mint condition machine. They're both kind of like scrappy computers that I bought from eBay years ago. 
and brought back on a business trip. And then I can plug this SD card into the bottom of the Model B so I can actually play those games on there. Plus I'll be able to see if the games that are corrupted on here work on the Model B and stuff like that. I really need to spend some good quality time with these machines. It's such a different convention using these BBC machines. BBC Basic is similar-ish to Microsoft Basic that you know, you're used to on Commodores and things, but it's still quite different. And especially all the awesomeness about loading things off ROM and having multiple ROMs and you can put other games on ROMs and all sorts of stuff like that. There's so much that you can do with this machine. It's so unbelievably flexible that I'm just not used to all those commands and the syntax and all that stuff. And if I don't use the computer for a while, I sort of start to forget everything about how to make changes and how to use it and all that kind of stuff. You have to kind of think back to what you grew up with and used a whole lot of. And it was Apple IIs and Commodores for me. So those weird commands like the load, you know, star comma eight and stuff for the Commodores, that all sticks in my brain because I was doing that as a kid. And the same goes for Apple IIs with the DOS that, that has an Applesoft Basic and you know, how, how the architecture works. So that stuff is just really easy to me. It comes second nature. It's like the riding a bicycle, it's like the back of my hand. I know it all really well. But when it comes to the British machines, like the ZX Spectrum and then these Acorn machines, things are just very different for me. And I, like I said, quality time, some good quality time, and probably just taking some notes, like I should just write down commands. I don't know why I don't do that. If I just had a little, a little piece of paper with the computer that just said like star configure to like look at all the CMOS options and you know put some other commands on how to change the file system and all that kind of stuff, that would really help me but I seem to always forget to do that. So actually, yeah, that brings up another ask I have for my viewers. If you are an expert at these Acorn machines and you would love to, or you could maybe make like a one page cheat sheet for me on the tricks, techniques, commands, you know, all the basic stuff that you, you need to know to kind of get started with these things. Like, oh, to configure the CMOS settings on the master, you do this and these are the commands and to, plug and unplug ROMs and to change file systems is what you do. And to, you know, look, boot a disk and, or to like hook up a disk drive and then boot a floppy disk, you use these commands or to use the SD card interface on the user port, you use this command, you know, that, that kind of stuff. It would be pretty helpful. I've looked around a little bit and I haven't been able to find something like that. And the user guides for these computers are very thick and comprehensive because they're from the eighties. So there's no like, you know, reference cheat sheet in there. There's just pages and pages and pages on how to like write basic programs and how to, you know, use that kind of stuff. So sometimes when you're looking for just the little bit of information you need, like how to get MMFS working on the original BBC so you can use your SD card, like here's a little like one pager, kind of like Richard included right here on how to do it for this machine. That kind of thing would be, yeah, like super duper helpful. Anyhow, I think that's going to be it for this video. Yes, Richard, thank you so much again for saying this stuff. Sorry it took me so long to get to it, but my master is finally upgraded with the awesome second user port and SD card interface that you have. I'll put links down in the description to those things if anyone wants to buy them. And then the uh, ROM switcher board that's in here, hopefully Richard has a link that he can give me to that as well. So I can put those down in the description below. And then thank you, Johannes, for all the Haribo candy, including the stuff I was just eating right now to raise my blood sugar. And I think what I ended up doing is eating too much of it. So my blood sugar is probably going to shoot way up. And now I'm going to have to go take some more insulin to bring it back down. That's one of the problems with candy is really I just need to eat a little bit of it and then wait until it brings my sugar up because that pico bala stuff is really hard for me to resist. Some candy I can, I can resist, no problem. I can eat a few pieces and whatever, put it away, no problem. But certain things I struggle with and, and that pico bala is one of them. So anyhow, yeah, that's really going to be it for this video. Thanks very much for everyone watching. I really appreciate it. Thank, thumbs up if you liked this video. If you didn't, you know what to do. Th huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are going to the side of the screen here. They get early access to videos and other behind the scenes stuff. They make it possible I do this full time. So there's a link down in the description below if you want to become a supporter of the channel. I do really appreciate it because I really appreciate my patrons here. So thanks again, Richard. And thanks again, Johannes. And I think that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. And I'll see you next time. Bye.